Hello, um, Ben Earl from Southern Water. Um, how much do the panel think that quarterly reporting is actually leading to less space for um, CFOs particularly to see the, um, the benefit of longer term thinking about these sort of things? Mm. And this is something we've talked a lot about on this stage before. Uh, with Unilever, for example. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? What does GSK think about this? Well, I, think, I think Unilever, all credit to them, and I think Diageo as well. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I actually have responsibility for quarterly reporting, and um, it's one of the joys of our life. Um, I, I, you know, I think, the, uh, so I think the, the broader point here is that one of the elephants in the room that we haven't talked about is how do we make sure that we have a, a, enough long-term focus to be able to make these kind of partnerships really work? And you know, back to this point about how do you measure it, actually, you, you know, the reality is you probably need five-year cycles, 10-year cycles mm. to demonstrate mm. the value here. Now, for us, that's not an anathema because we work in that kind of space, right? Drug discovery takes 10 or 12 years. The problem we've got, which is where you're going, is, you know, quarterly reporting puts a lot of pressure in the system. And I don't think there is an easy answer. The easy answer for me today is actually we should get rid of it and actually we should all, you know, go to six months or you know, yearly reporting. That's the kind of cycle that we should be trying to bring uh, to the fore. I, I think that's unrealistic given what's needed in the capital markets and what investors needed. Where I think we need to go is to try and unlock the right kind of dialogue with the investor base, which allows a more constructive dialogue around actually what are companies doing. So, so back to this idea of profit and purpose. You know, you asked me what success would look like. If in five years' time you could have, you know, the Black Rocks on this stage, and I mean the fund managers, not just the people that are kind of running the, it. The short-term institutional yeah, if investors. You, if you right? could have them up on this stage talking about um, the benefits that a company can bring, both short-term and quarterly, but also that they want a return over the longer term, which includes profit and purpose, then that is yeah. very yeah. much a success. Did you want to say something, Craig? Um, very quickly, I think the educating the analyst community, whether it's down the road here or whether yeah. it's Wall Street, I think is a key thing. I remember asking an analyst who did a presentation, an analyst who was analysing Accenture stock, and I said, you know, how important is this stuff that we do? That, and he said, well, frankly, not that important, and you don't talk about it. I don't, you know, I don't ask for it. Your CEO doesn't. So. Mm. It's one of these chicken and egg situations. So I think focusing on that relatively small number of people and making sure that they understand the value and educating them so that they will start asking yep. CEOs who aren't all in, as enlightened as, as, as yours. Okay, let's have another question. Yes. What a few. The, our resident skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Peter Knight from uh, Context. Um, I, I think the one thing that you haven't really dealt with is the PR value of these relationships. And the fact that we're sitting here with two you know, interfaces, glamorous in a, in a way, and certainly in the sustainerati you think so. Um, uh, but this, the, the PR value is good. So, you know, when zoos try to get sponsorship for their animals, you know, the pandas get all the money and the warthogs get nothing. Um, do you see in the, in the future uh, that business will have a warthog relationship with some of the really difficult social issues like prison reform or things like that, rather than the cuddly children saving. Okay, Tanya. Gosh, warthogs or pandas, <laughs> I had never thought of it that way. I, I mean, I think there is an element of PR value, but if I'm, if I'm really honest, I... I even with my media hat on, let's say I didn't work for a charity, I don't think there's enough PR value for it to be worthwhile for the company or indeed the recipient charity. You know, this is not 10 o'clock news type stuff. Um, I think there is a halo effect and a benefit within the organisation, and I think there can be with some stakeholders, but in, in pure cut-through terms, I guess I would argue I'm not convinced it's, it's sufficient. Um, I think... Also, at the heart of your question, though, is the less popular causes. And I think that is an issue. Yeah. I mean, there are some grossly underfunded issues, whether it sits within mental health, um, whether it sits in um, individuals or communities really at the margins of our society. Prison reform, right? Prison reform I think, is a classic example. Yeah. 
What we are seeing is some shift from other dynamics in terms of some of the social bond style funding starting to pour into those settings because actually there's some very defined outcomes and some defined measurables that actually, to be honest, sometimes in some of the more cuddly areas, it's harder to define. But I do agree. I think those are groups that are still grossly underfunded and I think we would do well as a community to consider how we could do a better job there. Okay, Phil. Sure. Well, I, I was, first of all, I agree with Tanya, but also I think it comes back to something you said earlier, Tanya, which is, you know, it's about constructing the right partnerships where there's a shared agenda. So, you know, an education services company looking at prison reform actually is perfectly bona fide, and I would say actually, you know, there's a clear overlap or opportunity there, and there's a clear PR benefit to that. So I, so I do think, you know, wherever you, wherever you look, and this is one of the reasons why there is so, there is cause to be optimism around where business can step into this, that you know, even in the most hardcore areas, there will be a business or there will be some kind of adjacency that the business can, can, can step into. And yeah. I, I think, again, you know, coming back to the bigger levels of ambition, how do you marry these, the, these, these organisations that need this and business together? Mm. You know, how do we do that in a more constructive way? How do governments help to facilitate that, or the supranational agencies? That's, that's the sort of thing and, I think we could look at. And if I'm right in saying, uh, Catch-22, who I've referred to a few times tonight, they created the probation service in the, in the UK, and they, they are looking very much for, for help to do work in yep, that area. Absolutely. Um, um, uh, uh, Chris Wright, or uh, the CEO of, of Catch-22. So we did talk briefly about that, but yeah, it's something else maybe we can talk about again in the future. Right, uh, let's have another question. Yes, right over here. Hello, <coughs> it's Ben Dixon from BG. Uh, it's a question about competition. And so obviously companies are competitive and to some extent NGOs are com competing for funds and resources. Uh, how much of a barrier is that? And the reason I ask is because we have two one-to-one -one partnerships on the stage, and they're both terrific from everything I've read and seen. But the next step would be to say, why doesn't the whole pharma industry pile into this partnership? Mm -hmm. Or why doesn't the whole carpet industry pile into this? Yeah. Yeah. Or indeed, why doesn't the whole NGO sector come in so we can bring in other NGOs into this? But obviously, there's a competitive issue here. I just wonder if that's a, something to think about. Yeah. Um, and why don't you pick up on that? Because you know, you took, actually, it was a question I wanted to ask. You know, what if other businesses go into the fishing nets and, 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 and want to make carpets as well? Yeah, and I mean, they, they already are through our, through our supply chain. So that's, that's already happening. Um, I think, again, it's about you know, what you're trying to achieve and the, the stage along the journey. So we wanted to start with this being you know, an interface SSL initiative and then something that could <coughs> roll out and affect other people using the same material. Our preference is that that material is used by other, other manufacturers outside our sector. So that's what we're looking at for, for expansion, so that you retain some degree of exclusivity within your sector. Um, but I think you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the classic tricky question. Mm -hmm. For me, I mean, two, two things. I think there is a boundary between the commercial and the pre-commercial and the pre-competitive space, where I think there's a whole lot of things that can be done pre-commercially. I think there was an announcement by in just a couple of weeks ago around some of the big um, media companies like Omnicom and Saatchi and Saatchi and all the other ones coming together around the SDGs and what they would actually do jointly around the SDGs. So there's something in an industry segment where you can collaborate pre-competitively, but I come back to that point around the challenge in your supply chain maybe you know the opportunity in an adjacent supply chain for a completely different organization to come in competitively commercially to solve that problem maybe with an ngo uh, maybe on their own perhaps so pre-competitive collaboration is, is is a big thing okay so another question got to be something out there nothing no one else got any other questions you can ask another one, Peter, yeah. I've got a couple, but uh, go ahead. I just wondered if you could comment on, the, um, on, on this phenomenon where companies are now being rejected as potential partners. So we've had tobacco for a long time. We don't want your tobacco money anymore. Um, but now we don't want your fossil fuel money anymore, uh, the Tate, the British Museum. Is, is, this, is this something that's going to get in the way of creating this, this, this new world that, that you're talking about? Yes. Um, I mean, if you look at a core charities governance structure, um, 
it has to absolutely justify in cast iron terms why it would turn down any donation. So the starting point in terms of how charities are constructed is that they would accept support that enables them to deliver their charitable objectives. So let's say a, a gift, as it were. What we've seen increasingly is because of some of the reputational issues, I think often concerns raised in and around the sector or indeed by consumers, a much stronger and more concerted approach to consider what kind of support and gifts to accept and on what basis. So I suppose if at times if you're an environmental charity or organisation at lobbying or pushing hard on some environmental issues, it can feel a little bit the usual, you know, Rob Peter to pay Paul scenario and it can feel in conflict. So I think that that is a challenge, not just today, but has been a challenge for a series of years. And I think I can only ever encourage any organisation, a charitable organisation, in, in really weighing up the balance of that very carefully indeed. And very often these are fine, fine judgment calls. You can run as many risk matrices as, as you like, um, documents coming out of yours. It has to be a fine judgment call. Um, and again, I always come back to some of the litmus tests, both can you look at your employees, can you look at um, your beneficiaries, and know hand on heart you've made the right decision. Because you know, there were a lot of voices coming out and you know, of your own supporters, whether it was employees, I think were sort of nervous about this partnership in 2013. The people that are donating a tenner every month or whatever would say, I'm not giving you that tenner because, ooh, evil pharma. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, specifically on the GSK partnership, I didn't hear a single piece of consumer feedback or supporter feedback that was concerned about it at all. Really? No, we've got endless supporter care systems and things coming in and out of the organisation. Where we did receive some questions did relate to our staff overall in terms of, I guess, looking back on some of the healthcare systems from the past, some of the role of the pharmaceutical industry also. <coughs> And I, th I think what's important in us making our decision and having a conversation with um, all our people around the organisation is the reasons why we made it. We don't make decisions just looking at past history. Um, we need to take that into account and we need to take into account what that organisation might have done um, through the course of that history or new steps that they've taken as a result. And again, this is where the trust is actually very, very important indeed. Mm. But I think we have to be incredibly careful not to punish historic actions or just things that were uh, mistakes that actually an individual or, or an organisation would recognise were wrong and they've dealt with them. But there will be skeletons in the closet. My experience of, of some NGO business partnerships, many of the NGOs were looking for organisations to be whiter than white, whether it's the past, the present, the future, and, and you know, organisations, to my mind, are a bit like human beings. We're all pretty <laughs> imperfect, right? You might have a good friend, but they might be a little bit of a pain sometimes. They might be a little bit, so we have faults. I, I think, sorry, I agree. Yeah, go on. And, and it's inevitable, but I, I think at the root of your question is actually what, why what is, what is this partnership about, this potential partnership about? And I, and I think the only way you can really attack this is through trust and transparency. And I don't mean that to sound trite, but I do think that um, why, why, would, why would two organisations not come together because there is a perception either between the organisations or on the outsides of the organisation that something is not right, right? That there is some nefarious reason, whether it's PR or whatever, for these two organisations to come in together. And therefore, fundamentally, if you are going to enter into any kind of partnership, you've got to be prepared to be ultra-transparent. Mm -hmm. And I think without that, you, you, you are, and, and in the areas you're talking about, you, that's, that's where the, the perception is going to you know, get hold of reality and, and sway it away. So I think a lot of this comes down to transparency around why two organisations are coming together to work together and what they're trying to do. Okay. You know, I think trust and transparency is a really good place to finish. Um, can you save it? Is it a really, really quick one? He was the guy who couldn't get his bike parked, so we should let him ask Oh, was question. he? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, we are going to let you ask this question because you can get your bike parked, apparently. Hi, Hi, Richard. Uh, the question is, if we want to go to scale, shouldn't we be as NGOs and businesses working to change the rules of the game, lobbying together on policies that enable the businesses that want to do the good stuff to win in the environment and the NGOs to come together to governments and make that case. 
Isn't that how we'll get to scale? Not by multiplying up the existing commercial partnerships that we've got, but by changing the rules of the game together. Thank you. Okay. Very quick comment. Yes, yes. I, I guess we're all in agreement there. Who, are, we, are you really trying enough to change the rules of the game? Um, are we trying enough? Um, well, we, we actually have as one of our work streams an advocacy platform. Uh, I would say it's, you know, it's, it, it's probably one of the more challenging, if I'm really honest. But I do think, I think the premise is absolutely right. I also think there's a piece around the infrastructure that you're lobbying. So whether that is also fit for purpose. So it's not just for me, it's not just necessarily the policies. It's actually, is the, is the infrastructure, i.e., you know, the United Nations or the WHO in our case or whatever, are they able to, um, to, to support that, the, the, the business and the partner coming together? So I think it's actually, I would think it's a joint advocacy position around policy, and it's also about looking at structures and support vehicles to make these partnerships work. I'm going to stop it there. Um, thank you very much indeed for your questions. I'm glad we were able to get your question in, in as well. Uh, Gib, Phil, Tanya, and Miriam, thank you very much indeed uh, for your thoughts and your candor tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.